live. Nice. Okay. Uh, my name's Wilfred Waters. I am the manager, custodian, the founder of the Geospatial Index. Uh, we are, as of now, at uh, 200... And 76 geospatial companies in uh, the fields of geospatial, remote sensing, CAD, LIDAR, navigation, consulting, in geospatial, needless to say, indoor positioning, seismic, surveying, etc., and autonomous systems, where geospatial devices, software, services are used to facilitate the creation, management, successful navigation of an autonomous system. So yes, yeah, stocks in 15 sectors from technology services, electronic technology, producer manufacturing, you name it there on the left, um, and 41 industries, packaged software, which is what you'd expect, uh, engineering construction, another one you'd expect, semiconductors, um, especially when it comes to LiDAR um, and other related devices to assist with autonomous navigation. Aerospace and defense, you'd expect that as well. A huge number of massive deals in the geospatial industry are related to geoint, or geospatial intelligence. <coughs> uh, telecommunications uh, equipment is another um, industry, significant industry, um, amongst these, 200, these 276 uh, stocks globally on nearly 30 stock exchanges, nearly 30 countries um, relate to. So I've spent over a year developing this list. <clears throat> it's time now to start to capitalize on it, um, read the rewards of my homework. And let me tell you, there have been so many late nights uh, you wouldn't believe. Um, I've been up until 5 a.m. at least once, many times beyond midnight, um, trying to cope with my obsession collecting all of these companies. We've got companies in there from Abu Dhabi to Malaysia to New Zealand. I don't know if we've got any, yeah, we've got a couple of Swiss ones. Um, Ublox is one from Switzerland. Uh, let me show you somewhere down here. Uh, let's go down here. Ublox, Ublox, Ublox. Here it is. <clears throat> um, so yeah, literally covering the entire world, uh, I think we've done a really good job. So as I said, it's time to start to figure out uh, how to deal with this stream of information intelligently. Um, and in addition to earning an income from this industry through a salary, uh, excuse me, I do have some dinner here on the on the desk. Um, I might occasionally um, have a bite or take a sip. This is going to be a long session. So as I said, the point of this is to illustrate to everybody who is so diligently working, slaving away, maybe stressing over their career that they are so diligently um, earnestly fashioning in this glorious industry of ours that is growing so fast. Uh, the point of this here index is to point out that not only are these 276 companies um, sources of income via a job, these 276 company, companies are also um, really one of the three ways that you can derive uh, an income or a, a financial reward to experience prosperity via the geospatial industry. The first one's a job. Well, okay, not in, not in order of importance, but hey, one of them is a job, the one most of us are familiar with. The other one is somehow owning a geospatial company. Um, and it just so happens that there's, there are these mechanisms out there in, in many countries called stock exchanges where you don't have to have enough money to buy a whole company or have the negotiation skills necessary to form a group of friends or associates um, to buy a part of a private company and spend money on lawyers and drawing up contracts and all of this. No, um, you can simply register with a stockbroker and without knowing or talking to anybody, I'm not kidding, anybody at all, you don't even have to speak to a broker, um, you can start buying pieces of a certain kind of company, a company called a public company company. 
This is a really vital function um, in the societies that um, uh, pe those of us who live in who, who are lucky enough for, for those of us who are lucky enough to live in societies that offer um, this mechanism of business ownership um, to their citizens. Uh, so that is uh, source number two um, of experiencing <coughs> generating prosperity through the geospatial industry. The first was a job. The second was um, part ownership um, of a public company um, listed on a stock exchange. The third one is entrepreneurialism. So having some sort of a systematic approach for identifying um, uh, needs in amongst the public or the business community, um, some group of people um, that you have a, a, a good enough mechanism to identify strong enough needs such that enough people will want to pay for that need to be met um, through a geospatial product or service um, that you create. So basically, we, yeah, I'm not, not really talking on, on this channel about how to find jobs or, or get an education to, to get one of those jobs in the geospatial industry. Um, I think that's pretty well covered um, in society. Um, university has got that covered off and a few quick Googles um, for job sites will pretty quickly help you find um, uh, geospatial jobs. <coughs> um, also, I will, so that leaves then um, entrepreneurialism um, uh, with the associated discipline, by the way, of product management um, and investing. I am quite certain, based on the year of research I've undertaken, that investing, or what I in fact prefer to call business ownership in geospatial, um, is not well catered to. The, the people have general knowledge that the stock exchange exists. Um, there is far, nowhere near enough of a, a strong habit um, of business, geospatial business ownership um, as far as I have, have come across um, in the broad um, geospatial circles that I've exposed myself to. Um, and I think it's fairly credible to say, uh, for me to be able to say that, given this is the fifth country I have done geospatial in, um, uh, and I've been doing it since 2011 um, professionally. I do not see, um, in those five countries over those years, more than a decade, um, a strong tradition um, and awareness of uh, a, a normalization of ownership of geospatial businesses um, amongst professionals. And I have worked uh, and currently work you know, in, in some of the most aggressive, dominant uh, geospatial consultancies in the world um, so to me, there is a dismaying gap to fill. Um, here I am um, doing my best to perform public service um, for our industry um, by creating this list. And now, as I said, um, beginning to step you through a responsible and diligent, systematic and evidence-based way um, practiced by some of the most successful business owners in history. Uh, based essentially on a distillation of some of the best research out there um, that appears to underpin success, long term it should be said, um, decades long, in a context of decades long ownership, um, success uh, or, or genuine prosperity um, creation um, through business ownership. So, uh, that was a long speech to start with. Um, I th it's we can stick, I think, for the moment on um, the index. This is a public list. So I think I can put it. Can I put things in the chat on this thing? Here we go. So I'm going to put this in the chat and I'll send it. Uh, there it is. Cool. Um, so that list, anybody can access and you can get the latest, you know, of my research. <coughs> and um, I welcome arguments and, and disagreements as well, by the way. Um, for what should and shouldn't be in the index. So what happens when you load up that link? Maybe we can start from the beginning on that. So let me uh, create a new tab and I'll pretend that I'm you and I'm putting this uh, link in and we'll see what happens when it loads up. So you are going to get, when it finally loads, you'll get this. It'll be on the price tab. You'll see the number of symbols and there'll be a bunch of columns and you can sort them any which way you want. Um, so... Mm, to cut to the chase in figuring out how, once you're aware that this, this list exists, to cut to the chase in terms of what to look at to give yourself the a chance of not losing money, right? Not losing money, this is a key concept here. 
Um, my approach is not to make money. My approach fundamentally is not to lose money. Yeah. Uh, by the way, another thing to bear in mind is I have a multi-generational, that's right, multi-generational approach to business ownership. I, uh, you can see I, from the beginning, I am weeding out the, the term uh, trading. I'm not even going to mention that word again in this stream. I'm also weeding out the term investing. To me, that's not nowhere near visceral enough. It doesn't set you up psychologically for um, productive engagement here, no. Um, the, the idea here is business ownership. Um, so how, as a multi-generational business owner, so I'm setting myself to, up to buy an ownership stake in these businesses that I will never sell in my life, in my generation, but I want to pass on to the next generation. Okay, so that's the attitude I have. I'm, I'm buying ownership stakes and never selling them. So what approach should I take to set myself up to not lose money in the very least in that context if I take a multi-generational uh, position? So I'm going on the financials tab. <clears throat> and I see a bunch of columns here. Revenue, so that's how much um, how much in sales a company makes um, in a given year, and it's in the local currency. Let's switch it over to USD so everything is um, the same and we can more easily compare them. So let's rank the whole lot. All 276 of them ranked by revenue. Uh, so how much, in, how, many, how much in products and sales, um, they, how much from uh, their products and services um, they generate in sales a year. So the top is Amazon. And the reason Amazon is in there is because of Amazon Web Services, which you can carry out or use for actually for uh, you can use for geospatial queries. Funnily enough, um, and there are some fantastic, um, really high utilized, well known um, geospatial services and products that are run on AWS. So that's why they're in here. Um, so yeah, you can sort it by revenue. We can see the highest performing. If you want just a pure play geospatial, let's go down the list. What's the highest? Earning with pure play geospatial. Let's keep going down. We're probably going to miss one. We'll get there. So Oracle is there, but it's that is the um, one of the OG um, geospatial stocks because it's a spatial database. But that's not pure play geospatial, is it? Let's go down further. Surely we'll get to one. Komatsu is an interesting one. They have three hundred plus uh, geospatial. Um, or basically GNSS related um, patents, so they're a really important one to pay attention to. Still haven't gotten to any pure play geospatial ones as far as I could see. Uh, let's keep going. L3 Harris, another really huge um, dominant geospatial firm. Uh, Leonardo Obiashi. I feel like we should be getting to one soon. Um, keep going. I'll tell you what I'm looking for. I am looking for Autodesk. There we go. So they make just shy of five billion US dollars a year in sales. Okay. So from what I can see from that quick um, uh, scroll through these uh, companies, that is the dominant pure play geospatial firm. Um, admittedly, they are in CAD, but within the geospatial index and um, all the sub sort of categories that I, I listed off at the beginning. We can legitimately say um, that they are the highest earning uh, pure play geospatial firm. Okay, so bearing that in mind, um, what else can we, we look at? So we've got earnings per share. I'm not so interested in that, um, but that's, you know, if you owned one single share of Deer and Company, um, the tractor maker, basically or agricultural slash earth moving equipment maker, um, they would uh, earn 35 bucks a share, basically, 35 bucks per, per share the UA. The next one, and this is starting to get uh, interesting um, from the perspective of filtering out the companies um, or finding ones that um, reduce the chance of you losing money through taking a multi-generational ownership position, is the price to earnings ratio. So essentially that is the number of years of earnings to pay for the price of the business. So I've sorted this by descending and you've got something slightly hilarious here. So this is GI Engineering Solutions Limited. What is this company? They're traded on the um, 
uh, on the BSE. This is a um, an Indian company. So let's have a look. They require you to wait one and a half thousand years to pay for the business. So this basically says that the stock market is incredibly enthusiastic about the growth potential of this business because presently it earns essentially nothing. Um, and it, just by purchasing the whole business, sitting there and, and without growing it and waiting um, to be paid back for the, the cost of the outlays to purchase the whole business, you're gonna have to wait one and a half thousand years. So essentially, um, either there has been an error by the market in pricing that business, um, or there are signs of incredible growth to come, which I think is a credible thing to say for India. Um, the I Indian um, stocks, and there's about 15 of them in the geospatial index, are all going incredibly well. Um, so that's probably factoring into the enthusiasm um, that the, the, pub the investing public in India, it should be said, because it's not possible to buy shares um, in Indian uh, businesses as a foreigner, um, have for, for this business. So, okay, may, maybe I'm a bit suspicious, you know, I'm not sure that really it is going to grow that much to, to warrant me um, purchasing the business with presently such a comparatively small earnings. So I'm going to go down the list a bit. You know, we're still, so for Salesforce, a really well-known um, company that bought a geospatial company um, to help with um, maps, I think, of uh, delivery make routing calculations, um, you're still going to have to wait 95 years in terms of earnings per year. So you're going to wait for 95 years of earnings before those earnings, current earnings, pay for the current price of the uh, of Salesforce today. But still um, showing, and I think maybe, you know, you can see how for Salesforce, such a well-known, um, successful global um, American tech company, um, you could begin to see why the investing public has decided to, to express such enthusiasm about its growth prospects. But it really does um, sort of bring it home to you, you know, how uh, that it is literally 95 years of current earnings to pay for the current price of the business. Um, some, somehow it focuses the attention um, when you're aware um, that that's, you know, uh, how much growth is anticipated um, in this business by the public at the current price level. So let's, you know, maybe we're still not um, that enthusiastic, you know, we don't, we don't even want to wait 50 years or 40 years. So if you bought the New York Times, New York Times currently, its current earnings would take 40 years to pay for the price of the New York Times itself currently. So it's still implied um, a lot of growth, um, you know, before that, becomes a, 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 an intelligent decision um, to buy it at these levels. So let's keep going down. Uh, we're getting down towards 20 years of earnings. Um, you know, some investors um, might begin to think that, you know, these are, are pretty decent prices. Um, there's all sorts of dynamics though to consider um, with the price to earnings ratio and also, you know, the basic validity of it, but at least it's a, it's a beginning in, um, being able to rank companies um, and get the beginnings of a, a window on, you know, how uh, how cheap, how much of a bargain you might be looking at. Okay, so we're really getting down towards, you know, less than 10 years now. So these ones are starting to look a bit more attractive if you can make the case that they are not terrible businesses. Because obviously, if you think a business has absolutely no chance of growing, in fact, you know, it's more, more likely to go bankrupt, well, then you aren't going to um, assign a, a huge worth. You aren't going to want to pay a lot of money for that business because you're not anticipating that that business will be worth a lot more in the future, that suddenly, you know, in five years, it'll start earning double the amount of income it currently does where, you know, if you bought it at 20 times earnings, you know, today, but you're expecting five years, it's going to have double the income. Well, effectively, you know, if your prediction comes out right, you effectively bought it for 10 times earnings. Um, if you can't make that case, then that's where you start to get down to, you know, the businesses where, you know, here we've got one for, for you know, six years of income on the, on the part of CGG. Um, before it, the income it's generating presently will pay for the business. You know, that's a pretty 
pretty uh, quick turnaround time. You know, you're in the clear after six years and any extra income it makes is just free money, basically. Yeah. So it, down this end of this list is where a certain breed of investor um, likes to look. So one I've already looked at and profiled it on the newsletter um, at geospatial.money is BGTNA, which is a Korean um, device manufacturer. Um, things like um, dash cams, radar detectors. Um, the reason they made it into the list is because they have a GPS uh, watch for golfers. Um, so, you know, that's a positioning device. So um, automatically, because it's publicly traded, I had to put it in the list. And because of the low multiple, so that the current earnings of that business will pay for the value of the business in uh, just over five years. Um, so I decided to put it through the, um, the, uh, my, my investment framework. Um, uh, as you might have seen on some, in some of the shorts that I have um, been putting up on YouTube in the past two to three weeks, um, I've been focusing on agricultural companies. So I already flagged um, Komatsu before. If I, I can actually uh, sort them all. I don't seem to be able to search this. There we go, Komatsu, cool. All right, so there's Komatsu. There's also Kubota. Um, and Farmer's Edge was another one. There was an agricultural stock. not in the list. Farmer's Edge. Should be here. Let's have a look. EF Farmer's Edge. Strange interface. This sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. Uh, there we go. So um, I might also bring up another tab and log into ShareSite, which is the portfolio tracking tool for the actual geospatial index portfolio. Um, an equal weighted index, 100 Australian dollars to start for each of the components, um, which I have split up into sub indices. So I'm going to use this just to check that I have got all the agricultural or precision agriculture stocks. Ag, where is it? Ag, ag, ag. There we go. Komatsu, Kubota, Agco, CNH Industrial, Deer, Farmer's Edge. So, Deer. Deer, Deer, Deer. There it is. So, I have checked them all off. I'm going to remove the other ones that I didn't want to chart. And I'll go down to the bottom and we'll look at this little chart of all of these ag stocks. Suzhou, no. Agco, yes. Arcadis, no. Looks like a previous session I had selected a bunch of extra ones. Okay, let's have a look at the chart. So, yeah, we've got five stocks there. And there is one, two, three, four, five, six. Oh, which one do I miss? CNH. Agco, CNH, Deer, Farmer's Edge, Komatsu, Kubota. One, two, three, four, five. Agco, CNH, I. Deer. I must not have ticked Deer. Ah, this is a bit annoying. Deer, Deer, Deer. I swear I pressed the button on that. Oh, okay, it's ordered by ticker, not name. D, 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 D. I've selected a button, I haven't ticked the button. Okay, so let's have a look at the little chart down the bottom that um, over the past year, TradingView shows us. So over the past year, the Japanese stocks are up, and that's a phenomenon um, that we've seen happen in general. Um, something very interesting to focus on because for, uh, we can also all arrange by country. 
the geospatial index using share sites. So it takes a while to think about it. So I'll go back to the to trading view whilst it does that. Um, however, the other stocks outside of Japan um, are down. So Agco is down 13.5%. Dio is down 16. Farmers Edge 23. Farmers Edge is basically a zero. Um, although it's up nicely recently. Um, interesting case, Farmers Edge. Um, and then CNH Industrials are down 30, 33% essentially um, the past year. Let's look at the past five years. Um, so you can see Farmers Edge. <laughs> they, if, if we can make the case that Farmers Edge is going up, uh, this is something that we should definitely look at. Um, but yeah. So deer is up 150% past five years. You, know, you can basically see the effect of COVID and then the massive influx of free money um, to revive the world economy, basically, um, which Farmers Edge and Agco have evidently gained from, um, uh, done extremely well on the back of. Um, but overall, um, the whole lot in the past five years have done relatively well. Um, but there has been a significant cooling um, of everything in the past uh, month. Uh, well, actually, the past month has been a, a bit of a revision, a, a, a return. Um, past three months, but definitely the past, the whole lot is down in the past three months. The past year, there has been, a, as I said, a general trend of them going down. Um, and this has been picked up on in Barron's, um, a really great Barron's Ag. So, Barron's is a fantastic. Um, uh, stock research magazine. Um, if you're in the UK, it's only five bucks a month, I think, or maybe four, four pounds a month. Um, you really, basically, you can't make a case to not um, own, have have a, a subscription. Um, you get the Wall Street Journal as well. Anyway, so the, they have noticed a pattern um, of the agricultural sector um, being punished, um, and yet being populated by companies that perform quite well. So I just said they perform well. So what does that mean in combination with the observation that the price to earnings ratio is quite low? So we were talking about how if you've got a company the way you can pay for the value of the company, the price of the company in a short period of time with the income that it earns, then that's sounding like it's an attractive deal, right? If you can combine that with the, uh, the if you can successfully argue for the more that the company's got, not going bankrupt, and even more that the earnings are going to improve, then you're looking at quite an attractive situation. Um, in fact, what I've just described is what John Meyer calls the um, the twin engines of hundred baggers. So, what on earth is that? Does that sentence or phrase even mean? So, twin engines. John Mayer, 100 Baggers. So this book, you can basically pick up um, extremely cheaply. I, I think he, I've even seen him on a podcast encouraging you to find a place um, to download it for free. And I think this is one. Um, so what, what the hell is a 100 Bagger? It's a, a company that goes up 100 times in value after you buy it. Um, and he basically wrote the sequel to an earlier book by uh, Phillips, I think, called 100 to 1 in the Stock Market. And I think he wrote that in um, the 1970s. Uh, also a really great book to look at. And basically, both of them were just looking at, um, I think, 360-odd companies um, over the 10 years or 20 years prior to the, the um, book that they were writing, um, sifting through the market for companies that got up 100 times and then trying to find the patterns behind that. So... Basically, what Chris Meyer said is that you want ones um, that are selling for a low multiple. So we, we introduced the concept of multiple here. The multiple of the number of times um, this the earnings go into the price of the business. If the multiple is low, it means that the earnings are high compared to the price of the business. Can you imagine, for example, buying a business which earns so much money um, as much money as the company is worth, um, earns as much money in one year as the entire company is worth. I mean, so after a year, you're in the clear, right? So if you can make the case that that income is not going away, you know, that the company is not, um, not going bankrupt um, or that it hasn't lost all of its customers, so that income 
and not going to drastically decrease, then what you're doing is essentially noticing an opportunity before the rest of the market has. Um, and this is a great place to be in because remember what I said at the start, we don't want to lose money. I'm not here, I know it sounds counterintuitive, um, but I, I'm not actually here to make money. I'm here in a multi-generational business ownership context to not lose money. Yeah? So to, for, if that's the approach and I'm never going to sell, then I want to, and, and I have essentially infinite time, right? to um, realize some sort of a gain or generate prosperity, then it becomes quite simple. I just need to buy companies that have been discarded by others, you know, uh, what you could call fallen angels, right? Companies that have, have a significant track record of more than 10 years. And so you can look at their financial performance and other performance over a decent period and gain a feel for how they are. Maybe they've gone through a bad patch, you know. For example, with the industry, the sorry, the agricultural companies, um, they're going through a bad patch at the moment simply because interest rates are up. And these are expensive equipment dealers, right? A, a tractor, especially a agricultural tractor with, you know, six wheels and whatever, um, we're easily up to hundreds of thousands of dollars to, to, to buy one of these. So, if interest rates are way up and therefore commodity prices are down and farmers are no longer you know, minted with money, they're going to make do with the equipment that they have. They're not going to go out and buy the latest Agco um, amazing spreader and you know, um, harvester and um, all you know, subscription to a high precision, um, uh, precision agriculture solution you know, where the, the tractor drives itself and things like that. Um, and some sort of dashboard with a map to help them identify, you know, the places to increase the um, concentration of um, fertilizer application um, because of some remote sensing solution. It's amazing, actually, the sort of stuff our, our discipline does for, for, for farming. They're going to stop spending. Um, and as a result, um, you know, probably partly because a lot of that equipment is purchased um, with a loan. And because rates are going up... Um, fewer can service those loans, or they can only service smaller loans. So less equipment is going to be purchased, right? So whilst that situation is being worked out, the price of these businesses is going to come down because it's anticipated, at least in the short term, that they're going to earn less money. So with that dynamic, um, we, with that explanation, you can begin to understand why um, with this price to earnings ratio field sorted descending, some agricultural stocks are towards the bottom of this list. So then the game simply becomes, right, so how I'm going to interact with this list from now on really, is just to sort by, you know, a descending on the price to earnings ratio as the beginning, not the end of my analysis, and uh, basically look at which of these companies are not bad. Some of them will genuinely be bad. Some of them will temporarily be bad, and I can make a credible case for them becoming good again. So, um, to begin to step into a, a judgment of that, we can look at CNH Industrial. So they're primarily traded or presently traded both on the Milan Stock Exchange, which is the where they're, that's their main exchange. Um, they also traded on the New York Stock Exchange, something I also mentioned recently, which actually came up in Barron's. Again, another recommendation, um, a free recommendation. I most certainly am not high profile enough to have an advertising agreement with um, the Dow Jones. <laughs> um which ultimately publish is, is the source of these publications. Is it? No, I don't know. Somehow, I think mean, no. News Corporation is the source. Well, at least they are the source of Wall Street Journal. Anyway, um, so what uh, was mentioned in Barron's is that um, they're exiting the Milan Exchange and they're just going to be on the New York Stock Exchange. So that selling pressure for all the portfolio managers and other owners. Um, of the Milan Stock Exchange shares is causing overall downward pressure on this stock. It's also affecting the price of the shares on the New York Stock Exchange. So 
this has created an opportunity just based on um, simple uh, mechanisms to do with exiting one stock exchange to begin to look at artificially lowered price for the business that may be temporary. Yeah. Anyhow, um, so let's have a look at it from other um, another perspective than just um, simple uh, mechanisms to do with unwinding um, its membership of a particular exchange. So let's, uh, this is the, we're on the financials tab. Um, we're going to go to statements and immediately I don't want quarterly. I couldn't give a damn about quarterly numbers, um, partly because they are not audited. Um, I would in fact prefer that there was a decade tab here, but the best I can do is annual. So we're on the income statement. And remember we were talking about the ratio between earnings and the price of the business. So let's go down to operating income, which is the version of earnings that I prefer to look at. And we can see um, 2016. Um, so we've got basically eight periods here that TradingView offers um, users. Um, so 2016, they were earning 1.82 billion in operating income. Um, and now they've more than doubled that. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's not terrible. You know, they've shown some growth. Um, and that's sort of all visualized up here on the chart. So then we can go to um, balance sheet. Again, we're still stuck on annual. Um, and we can look at total equity. So this is the um, total assets minus liabilities. Um, we can see, again, it has gone up by basically 50% um, since, uh, since 2016. Let's go to cash flow. So there's a few different versions of this, but the one you want to look at is cash from operating activities. And here we're beginning to see um, the effect of the um, rise in interest rates and the um, resulting impact on the money flowing into uh, or cash flowing into this business. So 2016 was two and a half billion. It, and now, or well, the last uh, um, audited report, is only half a billion. So, you know, look at this drop off. You know, they, 2021, they were doing not too, not too shabbily. Um, it was similar to operating income. But now it's almost, you know, it's as though they're going bankrupt almost. Past trailing 12 months, things have picked up a bit, almost back up to, you know, three quarters of a billion. So we have a solid track record. And then something looking like a temporary drop. We're having effectively, this is kind of what a fallen angel could look like. Yeah. Um, but there's another way to look at this. So if we go to the statistics tab, change it over again to annual. And here we go. We've got the price to earnings ratio, which is what we started this whole journey with. So you can see the trend of this, and sometimes it's there's nothing, and that's basically when they have negative earnings, when they're losing money, yeah? But then when it's positive, when they're actually making some money, the um, price to earnings ratio seems to hover, you know, somewhere around 10. And there's some particularly good years. But presently, it is depressed. You know, it's less than six and a half years of um, um, earnings to pay for the price of the business. Very interesting. Let's also look at the price to cash flow. Um, what does the trend look like? So a overall, it's pretty low. Usually, it op often looks like a cheap business. It looks like for most of the past decade, the investing public has not been incredibly enthusiastic about the capacity of this business to increase its earnings because the multiple, you know, has often been sort of around five years. Effectively, the market has been um, saying they're only happy um, to price this at five times its current um, cash flows. And presently, it is elevated. And that is down to the fact that, as we saw on the cash flow uh, statement, the uh, cash from operating activities is, going back to the annual tab, um, 
unusually low. Okay, so what can we say? Um, let's dig a bit deeper. So we're looking at the valuation ratios. Let's go down to profitability ratios. So this is basically a marker of the stewardship, the capacity of the managers of the business to steward the capital used to run the business and ultimately used to generate more capital, yeah? So a couple of ones to look at is the return on equity and return on invested capital. Actually, what I prefer to look at, but what TradingView doesn't calculate automatically, um, is the return on capital employed. But, you know, nevertheless, these are, you know, some you know, halfway house sort of proxies for, for that. So basically, you know, what, in terms of return on capital employed, what the market as a whole, and by the market, I mean the Standard & Poor 500, the top 500 companies in the US market and basically the world, um, they return about 10%. So for every hundred dollars of capital that is employed to you know purchase the bicycles that are then rented out to earn an income to return some capital on the hundred dollars that was employed, that bicycle company will return ten dollars every year for the hundred dollars in capital um, that is outlaid by the the management team of the bicycle company. Here you can see that it's less. It's less than 10% for the return on invested capital, which, as I said, is not quite the same as return on capital employed, but it's, you know, um, sort of the same. Close enough to, for me to talk about it. Um, so maybe I'm, I'm not so impressed about the capacity of this management team to really, you know, kick it out, of, hit it out of the park um, with, with my $100 that I want to give them. You know, they're only giving me, you know, $7.80. Whereas, you know, in some years it's negative, some years it's significantly less, actually, actually it's been good recently, okay? So maybe there's, you could say that maybe there's a trend, you know, maybe they're starting to do better than they have previously, but still it's not more than 10. And actually, because I'm spending a lot of time to analyze this business, I want a company that earns a lot more and re returns a lot more than the average company. Because I, let me tell you, you know, I, I don't need to put in all of this effort. Probably, actually, to be honest, I'm not going to do better than the market in the long term anyway. If I want to just get the 10% per year and sleep well at night and not put any effort in whatsoever, I can just buy a low-cost index fund from Vanguard, um, BlackRock, uh, Fidelity, you know, preferably Vanguard because it was started by Jack Bogle, who was you know, every man's uh, hero in the uh, bank investment world or business ownership world. He deliberately set up a company. He's died only recently, um, unfortunately. But the company he created, Vanguard, is set up for the express purpose of creating low-cost index funds that track the performance of the market. You know, you can get one for the, the whole market or just the S&P 500 for the whole world, whatever. Um, but the idea is that they're passive. Um, they uh, mechanistically include only, for example, the top 500 companies in the US. And... Uh, you, you just sit there and let it own those top 500 companies and you do nothing. And you will have, because they're the top 500 companies, you'll have, on average, um, 10 bucks a year. They will be returning 10 bucks a year for every 100 bucks it's put in. So if you think about what you can get for free, basically, you know, the, 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 the management fee on those low-cost low index funds is of the order of 0.03% per annum, then if I'm going to be paid for putting in all this extra effort, then I need to have companies that are earning significantly more, maybe 15% minimum per annum, yeah? So on this basis, you know, I'm, I'm less enthusiastic about this company. I want something that's a bit better. So let's, you know, we've, we've gone that far in our little bit of, um, uh, of, of filtering, sorting, and having a brief look at the, the finances of one of our um, agriculture sub-index components. Let's go to Agco, noting that um, the earnings of Agco in seven and a half years will pay for the price of the business. So let's do what we did before. We went to financials, and then we went to statements. 
and we got a feel for how things are going with this company. So we looked, you know, eight years ago, 2016, and we saw the operating income is 300 million. And then if you have a look now, well, it's looking very healthy. It's, it's a whole cool $1 billion more in operating income per year. So, wow, this management team is doing well in growing this business consistently. Look at that. It's just a straight line. Brilliant. So let's go to balance sheet. Total equity. Uh, assets minus uh, total liabilities. So 2016, $2.8 billion. It jiggles around, jiggles around, but it's gradually going up. It's basically one billion more. Eight years later. Again, you know, not doing too badly. We know it's not a fraud because it goes up and down, up and down. But it's gradually, gradually. The the, the water level is rising. Yeah. Now let's go to cash flow. The one we were looking at is cash from operating activities. So 370 million, call it 2016. And now a whole billion more. Okay? Not bad, not bad. Hasn't seen the same drop off in uh, cash flow from operations that CNH Industrial has seen. Okay, so I'm, you know, I'm, I'm uh, I have to say this is the blue bar, yeah, significantly larger now than it was back then. So I'm, I'm left with a feeling that we have a solid, consistent, growing company here. Um, let's have a look at the statistics. So again, we're going to change it over to annual, and we're going to look at the PE ratio history. So you can see, this is definitely looking like a fallen angel. So consistently it's sort of 30 PE, sometimes down to 15. You know, it started off, you know, the past eight years, sort of around 30. And then gradually the past few years, it's dropped off significantly. So now we're down to eight, where before we were at 30. Let's look at the price to cash flow ratio. So similarly, you know, it's half what it was eight years ago and half what it was a year ago. So something's going on, which, you know, if we, again, can make a credible case that this is a temporary state of affairs, we can make a credible case that we can begin, we might have something which uh, has evidence of the, the twin engines for becoming a hundred bagger. Twin engines being buying at a low multiple so that we can have multiple expansion. So it will go from seven years of uh, free cash flow to pay for the business back up to, you know, 13. Um, so that basically means that if we buy now and we wait for it to go back up to 13, then the company is basically worth double what it was when we bought it. So we have multiple expansion, right? We want, we, we are taking a multi-generational never sell approach to business ownership here. So we want to have we want to buy when there are conditions, credible conditions, um, the table is tilted in our favor to produce multiple expansion and where there are the chances at least not for um, significant long-term uh, earnings decline, but earnings growth. If you've got multiple expansion and earnings growth on a significant long-term basis, if you wait around for, for the decades, even generations that this uh, is required to happen, you'll have a hundred bagger on your hands. Not a certainty. I'm talking about the conditions that um, bias things in favor of this occurring um, uh, in the long term over a, a, a significant number of stocks or businesses. Yeah. Okay, so let's go down further. We were gonna we were looking at return on invested capital before, and we see that well, it was looking like a pretty terrible company in 2016. And you know, but what else am I saying? I'm saying a significant kick up in 2021 and then it's maintained so something interesting is happening where the management team seems to be able to bring about conditions and it's the same for return on equity the management team seems to have been able to turn this company around from being a terrible company. For every hundred bucks that was invested, you only got four dollars back. To basically doing double what the market does at the moment. For every hundred bucks you put in, you get basically twenty bucks back. So this is a different picture than what we saw for CNH Industrial, which on the return metrics appeared to be consistently low. 
So on that basis, and coupled with the nice consistent growth that we've seen across the balance sheet, income statement, cash flow statement for Agco, combined also with the low multiple that it's at presently, it looks like it might be worth our time to really dig in to Agco. I've also got in the back of my mind CNH Industrial because they have a low multiple and you know had a favorable write up in Barron's, so you know that's always going to bias things for me. I love Barron's. As I said also in another short, you know, I love Jack Howe. Um, he is you know my, basically my favorite financial journalist and podcaster. Um, apart from of course um, Keith Gill slash the Roaring Kitty. <laughs> um but yeah, as I said from the beginning, casting myself as a business owner, taking a multi-generational, multi-generational approach to business ownership, and bearing in mind what um, uh, Phillips and Jack Meyer have said in 100 to 1 in the stock market and 100 baggers, that the twin engines of 100 baggers is multiple expansion and earnings growth. These factors all tell me plus sorry plus my basic approach is not to make money in the stock market no my money my, <laughs> because it's my money right and I put a lot of effort slaving you know over a job in this industry to get my money fundamentally my approach is not to make money through business ownership no it is not to lose money due to those factors I am settling on spending the next few hours getting a fundamentals based picture using the annual reports of AGCO to see if I agree with the idea of taking a multi-generational ownership stake in AGCO. Cool, so what the hell am I going to do to analyze this business um, to gain some confidence around um, taking an ownership position on, on, on this sort of a basis. Well, I am going to cheat in a couple of ways. I am going to cheat by studying at Stanford. That doesn't sound like a cheat because it's a really tough university, um, but Maybe you'll see what I mean, or at least appreciate my terrible ability to make jokes. So, uh, Professor Kenneth Jeffrey Marshall is my hero when it comes to this approach to business ownership. He wrote a fantastic textbook called Good Stocks Cheap, Value Investing with Confidence for a Lifetime. Note that this is a common sort of phrase here, lifetime of stock market outperformance. There's a, um, a page about this book. I'll chuck this in the chat as well. So, uh, you know, recommendations, blah, blah, blah. Of course, you know, why wouldn't I have testimonials? Um, but really, what I recommend is to study at Stanford. His course takes three months, 10 weeks. You study with, you know, 60 to 80 people from around the world. It's all held on Zoom. Once a week, you have a live lecture, and then he also sets a um, a, an assignment every week where you step through a framework to analyze a business. And, you know, if I'm a geospatial analyst and I've gained confidence in this, then I sure as hell have confidence that, you know, anybody really can. So I'm not sure if it's still live. Okay, so he's got links to it because he teaches not only at Stanford, but also, um... Uh, the Stockholm School of Business, School of Economics, excuse me. Um, here's the one. Uh, okay, cool. So it's still live. Okay, so this was back in 2022. Uh, it kind of goes off and on. Um, but you should check back at the Stanford Continuum Studies website for the current live version of uh, BUS123W. Let's have a search in here. Maybe there is a current live one. Have a look. No. Anyway, um, yeah, as I said, it's it's off and on. But when it is on, really recommend signing up 
um, and going through um, this course. If it's not on and you want to get straight into it, well then buy the book because this book takes you through the course anyway and it has chapter by chapter the same framework that's gradually built up along with spreadsheets and other tools to help you um, essentially build out a value investing tool or an uh, investment a business analysis tool um, to make decisions um, like I am trying to um, begin to, to make with my um, review of Agco here. So yeah, um, I, I admit that some of the things I'm going to say are based on an understanding of how to analyze businesses um, that comes from having done this course. Um, so you're going to have to bear with me, um, but at least I hope um, because I've put in front of you these resources, you can go away yourself, um, maybe just buy the book on Amazon. I really recommend it. It's so cheap to get it um, just on Amazon Kindle. Good stocks, cheap Kindle. And there's a desktop app for Kindle. Look, it's, it's, it's super cheap. It's all, you know, British prices because I'm in the UK at the moment. Uh, Kindle edition, twenty pounds. So you know it's not it's not expensive. Um, and if you have it on on a device, then you can copy and paste things out of it. Um, it it's basically a searchable resource right there, um, which is so useful for a textbook. You know, so I really recommend getting the the Kindle version. Um, and any device you have, you, or even your desktop, um, you can have a a nice, easily accessible electronic version. Okay. So that's one cheat um, to begin to, to step through why, um, whether or not Agco is, is worth taking multi-generational position, business ownership position. Another cheat is to go to my newsletter, geospatial.money, and go to the archive, and go down to my analysis of Garmin. So this was done February 2023. That was sort of at the height of the um, humanity's discovery of uh, ChatGPT and generative AI. So what I did, what really switched me on to the utility of generative AI, I have a lot of doubts about it. To me, it's not genuine intelligence because it can't come up with um, mathematical proofs. It doesn't use logic. It doesn't uh, reason. It doesn't do... Um, abductive reasoning, deductive reasoning, inductive reasoning, or numerical reasoning. Um, it simply uh, appears to extend the output of human reasoning or reasoning um, generated and recorded you know, by other uh, intelligences um, in a text format. Uh, so it's, it's not a real intelligence, but nevertheless, um, because it has access to so much reasoning output of other intelligences, um, it can do research for you in a flash that otherwise would take me a very long time. So you can see here a prompt I put together for um, for uh, ChatGPT um, to go out into the world and tell me about uh, Garmin. So the prompt I've used is using the company name above Garmin. Please provide a short report to me, starting with the company name as the title on one line. Next line, tell me bullet points in this order. Stock, ex stock ticker, exchange, products, customers, industry, legal form, operational form, geography and size. Then a paragraph describing extra details as you see fit. Then a bullet point list of 50 similar publicly traded companies, same industry, same country, with local competitors, and then an international competitors list. So, I, I spent hours late at night, many days, um, stunned at what this thing could do for me. Because it takes me sometimes hours just to write the understanding statement um, that you see here. Yeah? And it's there's, because, you know, I have, I have a tendency to get lost in the details. Um, I, I tend to take far too long to write these understanding statements, and yet this prompt using a gen, in a generative AI tool could regenerate this understanding statement in, in seconds. And I remember just spending hours and hours just basically generating these understanding statements for all of the companies that I was interested in, just because I just got them for me like that. 
So this is a cheat. And let's do the same um, in uh, um, in uh, Bing Chat um, for Agco. I have to just set something up. Just a second. Okay. So I'm going to put in here, and you can do the same with uh, with Bing Chat yourself, or ChatGPT, or Bard, or whatever. Bard is a new one, actually, recently. So uh, they've recently updated it. Um, so that's also one we can look at. So I'm going to run it now. So there is Agco with the prompt. And it's gotten straight to work. Yeah. So there it is. I would have taken ages to go and get all this stuff. So products. Tractors, combines, foragers, hay tools, self-propelled sprayers, smart farming technologies. That's that's where Geospatial comes in. Yeah. Farmers, contractors, agricultural equipment dealers. So the industry is agricultural machinery. Customers are farmers, contractors, and agricultural equipment dealers. Very interesting. It's a public company. Yeah. Operational form. Four segments: North America, South America. Yeah. Okay. Fine. It's worldwide. So a revenue of twelve point six five one billion. So that's something um, that's important to bear in mind with all of these generative AI tools. They are simulating what an intelligence through reasoning could produce. They are not actually reasoning. Because they are simulating, it makes perfect sense for them to um, provide, to simulate what a reasonable response might be. Not actually to provide a reasonable response. So what that means is that they might just write, you know, 12.65 billion, but that might act not actually be the case. So let's just go back to um, trading view and go to financials and go to statements and go to the income statement. What's the total revenue? So the trading 12 months is 14.51 billion, which is in the ballpark of the 12.3 billion that was just listed. If we go to quarterly, yeah, I don't know. Okay, there we go. So yeah, it looks like it was right. 12 point, where is it? 12.651, 12.65. Okay, so for once it was right. I've, so often I've seen just totally made up numbers about a lot of this stuff. Um, net income of 889 billion. Net income... Net income, 889 billion. Perfect. It's actually done well. And it's got a num quite a number of employees. Okay, so, you know, um, this generative AI response seems to be vaguely reliable. So, in summary, it's an American agricultural machinery manufacturer headquartered in Duluth, Georgia, USA. 1990 founded. Uh, parent corporation is the German one. Designs, produces, sells agricultural equipment. Uh, forages, self propelled sprayers, smart farming technologies. These segments, as we stated before, uh, customers include farmers, as stated before. And then a summary, yeah. So, it's all those bullet points summarized, basically. Okay, so local competitors, the first one. It seems right. CNH Industrial. John Deere. Kubota. Okay, we've got these already. Uh, Lindsay Corporation. Alamo. So it looks like I need to now go and review all of these extra companies that are not currently in the Geospatial Index and check 
if any of these do precision agriculture, so using GNSS, um, other positioning, timing, navigation equipment, um, to basically uh, make the farming process more efficient, less labor intensive. So I know also that this one is already out of date because as I said in another short, my most recent short, um, actually Raven was purchased um, wholesale off the market by CNH Industrial for 2.1 billion. Um, so that, you know, this is another benefit of me um, immersing myself entirely in um, the geospatial index. So then there's global competitors as well, um, a huge list. And it's funny how it's provided all the different stock exchanges around the world that, for example, Butcher Industries um, is listed on. So, you know, it's not so reliable sometimes, but still a bunch of quite interesting companies here. All right, nice. So, you know, as I said, this is a cheat because I need to fashion a decent prompt, but it then spits out this really useful response, okay? So then what if I want to know a bit more detail? Well, I've got another prompt for you. So this is the basic overview, but then I want to know the status of the company. So I'm going to just put in this prompt, status of this business, and I'm going to go to big chat. So I'm going to status of this business, so address factors such as market dominance, dividend, stock split, recapitalization, media coverage, litigation, court cases, recent partnerships, recent mergers, acquisitions, divestments or spin-offs, and changes to the business model, activist investments, um, certain significant transactions or events, or senior personnel changes. So let's see what um, Bing Chat slash GPT-4 has to say about that. Again, this would take me ages of reading news reports, uh, Googling, reading the annual report, uh, things like that. And here it is just responding immediately, along with citations. You can go and check where it gets it all from. Often you can see it's going onto Yahoo Finance, um, AgCorp website itself, so I don't have to go and read that. Um, so yeah, here we go. So it's a publicly traded company, market capitalization of 8.7 billion, 8789. So is that right? We can go on to the other tab, go to price. Uh, market capitalization, we're in USD, it was 8.89, AGCO 8.607 is what it says currently, so maybe Bing is a little bit out, so it's a uh, hundred million out, but hey, what's a hundred million between friends? All right, market dominance in the agricultural industry and one of the largest manufacturers of agricultural equipment in the world. This is interesting, remembering we are taking a multi-generational business ownership perspective here. We don't want to lose money. So when I hear global distribution, when I hear dominant, one of the largest manufacturers, these are good things. You know, we want a sure bet here, right? Um, Agaho has not announced any dividend or stock that recently. Also interesting to hear. Been in the news for recent acquisition of Trimble Ag Assets and Technologies through a joint venture. So this is fascinating, you know, I don't have to go into, you know, the merchants and acquisitions alerts in Google News to find out, you know, what's been acquired recently. I can just go on this, type it in, in the prompt, and it tells me. So I know, and you will know if you've been um, watching my recent shorts, um, that, and this is also something brought to my attention through Reading Barons, um, they acquired an 85% um, stake in Trimble's agriculture division. So they haven't bought an entire company like CNHI did for uh, precision agriculture and, and vertical integration on that for smart farming etc autonomous navigation for their um, tractors and things they've um, partnered up with one, one of the industry's most credible positioning um, companies Trimble and they've bought an 85% stake for 2.3 billion dollars um, in that company so that's that is a huge sign of how um, how valuable our industry is that um, a deal of that size could go ahead, yeah? Um, so massive investments happening, following a pattern established in the industry with CNHI in 2021 making the same sort of a deal. Uh, what else can I say? Say, Airco's not involved in any significant litigation or court cases recently, that's good to know. 
uh, recently partnered with Plevna Implement to expand its business in Western Indiana. Okay, cool. Operates through four segments. You know, just the geographic breakdown. That's fine. Um, what uh, what ChatGPT or, or Bing Chat is not doing, however, for me here is telling me the revenue or operating income per segment, which would be useful. Um, it says the company's not undergoing any significant mergers or acquisitions or. Uh, recently, well, I disagree. It's not really internally consistent, is it? Because they've also said that they recently began a partnership or joint venture with um, Trimble. Um, not made any significant business model changes, okay. Not been involved in significant investor, uh, activist investor activities, okay. So it seems to be saying there's no short selling or other um, muscular moves by hedge funds. And then it just lists off the, a few metrics about, about financials. Okay, cool. So, yeah, like I said, um, that's a bit of a cheat to begin to develop an understanding um, of the nature of the business, the status of the business, um, and also importantly, um, the products, customers, industry, legal form, operational form, geography, size, and status. If you can list off those one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight variables, status as well. Um, then, well, actually it's seven because size is really related to status. So seven variables. Um, then you can say that you understand the business. And why do you want to understand the business? Well, as I keep coming back to and repeating, you know, till I'm blue in the face, this is an approach to business, to, to interacting with Securities on the stock exchange, at least of your country, based around a multi-generational approach to business ownership, where fundamentally all of your behavior revolves around not losing money. It is not about making money. Fundamentally, we are here within a multi-generational ownership context not to lose money. So... Therefore, you better have a very, 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 very good understanding of the company. And the way to gain that understanding is to look at it from the perspective of those seven variables. Products, customers, industry, legal form, operational form, geography, and status. So, I mean, I was thinking that I would continue on with the entire framework tonight. Um, I have a massive big spreadsheet, which I'm very proud about, and I've really been waiting for probably a couple of few years, actually, to tell people about it. Um, so you can see all the tabs across the bottom here, which actually just are a faithful reflection of the framework taught in Good Stocks Cheap. And it can be summarized in a single diagram, which is lifted straight out of um, this, uh, this, this uh, book. So I'm on, I've just covered off the do I understand it bit, yeah? And if you can look at it in the inverse, given that we're wanting to take a multi-generational approach and bearing in mind that over a 50 year period, you can expect uh, the stock market itself to drop by 50% at least four or five times over a 50 year period, it's gonna drop by 20% every three years or so. So what is the best way to get scared out of a business ownership position? It is to not understand the business. Then you're going to sell it the minute it starts going down. But if you want to realize 100 times gains over a multi-generational time span and create genuine long-lasting prosperity for your family and many generations to come, you need to have a very long-term uh, uh, approach to business ownership. So, yeah. Um, that's why the first step is, do I understand it? And I think that's probably a good enough message for now. Um, I think it is a good thing that I 
have spent a significant amount of time just emphasizing the importance of this and, and setting things up from um, the perspective of the rest of, um, you know, how you go from the watch list that I am maintaining narrowed down to companies worth spending time on to analyze. Okay. So then there's the rest of the framework. Is it good? Is it inexpensive? Uh, and then once you have satisfied yourself that it's good and that it's inexpensive, um, finally, don't do anything until you can convince yourself that you're not biased in your decision making. So I'm getting a bit tired. I think that's it for now. Um, thanks for watching and we'll step through the rest of the framework uh, later on.